Hey everyone, Cynix here. Today I thought I would try a new video series for you guys, and this video series is all about studying. This may sound a bit silly, but I think it's important to not only show you how to properly study, but also to share my personal observations and notes as I study different topics. This first episode is going to be all about water, which is quite a vast topic, so more specifically, this episode is going to be about transparencies, colors, and reflections in bodies of water. I think you'll get the idea as we go along, so let's hop right into the first study. This one is based on an image from Google Maps, and I should note there are a few main types of studies you can do. You can do them from life, from a photo, or from another artist. Overall, I think probably photos are the most common studies people do though. I thought this one would be a good starting point because the water in it is very calm and it has a couple interesting qualities to it. I forgot to save the reference for you sadly, but it's basically a greenish colored pond surrounded by rocks, presumably on a mountain. I say presumably because we only have a small reflection of the sky color in the bottom right of the image. The rest of the water is within the shadow or dark reflection of the surrounding forest and hills. I should add, there is one extremely important rule for doing a study. Do not use the color picker. Studies are a great time to improve your eye for color, and you will miss out on all of that value if you just use the eyedropper to grab colors from the original. It really defeats the whole purpose. The best way to improve your eye for color is just to pick the color to the best of your ability, and then put it on the canvas and try to observe if your choice was darker, lighter, cooler, or warmer, maybe more or less saturated than it appears in the original. If you can factor in all those things and try to figure it out, um, more often than not, your eyes will slowly become more sensitive to these changes and you'll get better at recognizing color in general. The other main tip I have for you guys is to do as many mental gymnastics as you can to see the source image in completely different ways. This is really helpful in anatomy too, by the way. But for instance, in this first study, while I might actually be painting a pond, in my mind, I've decided that I'm painting a green valley with rocks between some darker and more reddish rocks. I'm not thinking about it as water at all at this point, and aside from that blue sky reflection in the lower right, there's really nothing to tell me that it is. I will say though, for a study in water, I think I wasted more time rendering rocks than I did water, but I gotta make it look pretty. As a side note, one of the main things I like to look for when choosing a reference is a strong mixture of warm and cool tones. This image has some strong blues and greens, but it also has some nice reds and warm rock tones as well. Even though the composition is pretty unremarkable, the colors make it an enjoyable image overall and pretty fun to paint. Anyway, once my lovely green valley is somewhat finished, it's time to make this look a bit more like water. In this study, one of the main things I noticed and learned is that the high value reflections are the only ones you really have to worry about. If someone was perhaps wearing a white and black striped shirt, you should be able to get away with simply painting the white parts in the water reflection and leaving the black stripes absent. Also, this painting was done mostly with the dry brush and Corel painter, just so you know, uh, but I am going to use the thick and thin pen to do most of the water reflections. And reflections can be pretty fun because they get to show the story of everything that might be happening off screen. Not only do we have a bunch of white rock structures off canvas, but we also have an old white haired lady here. Maybe she is taking her grandchild out on a hike and they're admiring the water. It's fun, you can make up your own little story. The last touch I need to add are some water ripples in the top right corner, and adding ripples is just a matter of spreading the reflections and shadows into thin and wavy strokes, traveling parallel with the water ripple direction. At this point, this image is pretty much done, so we can take one final look at it. The total time spent on this study was roughly one hour. It's hard to sum up everything I was trying to observe and learn through the study, so I think this would be a great time to do a quick review of what we've learned about water so far. I'm going to make a little diagram here to talk about water reflections and what we observed. Here's our side view of some water and our little person here, which represents our viewpoint. 
and let's put some rocks on the opposite side of the water as well. The first thing we may know about water is that if the sun is shining evenly and the water is very calm and flat, the surface is basically just a mirror. It's always painful for me to see when people forget about this most basic property. If nothing else, you can always just render water as a mirrored surface and it will probably look better than any other basic approach. It's certainly better than just making it blue. The box in the top right corner represents what our little stick figure here might be seeing in his cone of vision. And to get a little more in depth, if there is a shadow or dark value being cast on the water, then you can actually see through the surface toward the bottom of the water in a lot of cases. In a lot of foresty type ponds, the bottom of the pond is covered in moss and algae and other green life forms, giving everything that strong green appearance. If we perhaps put our character in front of the light source and have him cast a shadow, we would possibly be able to see the greener undertones of the pond in that shadow area. Similar to how in our last study, the surface of the water was mainly hidden in the darkness of the mountain. It can also be noted that the viewing angle should affect your ability to see through the water surface. Looking straight down into the water will always allow you for a more transparent view, while looking out at water from a more narrow angle will probably just show the reflective surface. The next important study note is that water ripples and choppy water will result in rippling or choppy reflections. When viewing things from this side diagram view, it should be obvious why. Our mirror surface is all rippled and distorted, producing all sorts of distorted reflections in every which angle. The final note I want to drill into my head is that once again, the high value objects reflect much more prominently than any darker objects could. This is just an effect of how color works and light travels. Anyway, now that we've done our recap, let's try another study. This time we're going to do a study of another artist's work. I've picked a plain air painting by James Gurney this time. The main added benefit of doing an artist study is that you can try to put yourself into their mindset and figure out their decision making process. Oftentimes this means getting a better understanding of different stylistic decisions and workflow tricks. I started this study with a very rough line sketch, which can usually be a good idea for keeping things speedy and mainly more reliable. While I roughen some basic flat colors, I should also mention that I'm using a new brush for this study. I made a brush that's basically just a hard edge brush with no opacity, but it does have a very slight texture effect if you press lightly or end a stroke. Studies are always a good time to try new brushes, and let this also be an example that it doesn't matter what type of brush you use. If you can make things look good with a hard edge brush and no opacity, and you should be able to make things look great with any brush. Anyway, back to the painting. I really like the original painting by Gurney because it has a constant mix of cool and warm tones. Even half of the rocks are cool grays and the other half are warm grays. I especially love any painting with strong blue shadow colors. The first big decision I needed to make was whether to do the water dark on light or light on dark. I'm Fairly sure the original was done by painting all the bright colors first in the water and then painting the darker values above them. For traditional painting, this would make a lot of sense because you don't want to pollute your bright colors, but with digital, it doesn't matter as much. So I decided to try going from dark to light, and I tried to get all the brown undersurface colors first because they all feel the most pervasive and transitional throughout the whole image. Once again, I suppose it's just like painting it as a darkened valley of dirt between rocks. Those mental gymnastics again. We'll just add the surface reflections after. There are, however, some bright oranges, which represent some of the near surface rocks in the water, catching a little bit of light. The source for this image is definitely more of a stream than a pond, so the water is definitely moving and flowing a lot more. All of the bright reflections in the water are going to be very choppy and rippled. 
we definitely have a lot of bright green reflections, which I assume are from surrounding plants and trees. And as a little scientific side note, you might notice that the bottom of this water area is brown instead of green. And that is because the water here is constantly flowing and moving, so you don't get all of that algae and micro plant life that we got in the pond study we did earlier. In this study, I also really wanted to focus on the areas where the water is moving the most, such as those minor little waterfalls between the rocks. These spots catch a lot of really strong and lovely bright blue colors. The sky is generally the brightest thing anytime you're outdoors, so anytime you get enough chaos in the water on a sunny day, there will always be some angle of reflection that bounces the bright sky back towards you. As we mentioned before, the brightest colors reflect the most, so because of all these factors, you can easily show the water splashing through the rocks with some bright blue colors. As we come to the end of our second study, I think the main thing I want to take away is the ambitious use of variated and saturated colors. You can see the finished image here. Overall, time spent on this study was about one and a half hours. It's always a good idea to write after the original artist anytime you do an artist study study. This not only makes sure you remember what it was based on, but it also makes sure that other people know it was an artist study and the original artist is credited. Normally, I just don't share a study if it's based on another artist uh, to save any potential confusion, but since this is for a video series about studies, it's important to mention that just in case you ever want to share an artist study with your friends or anyone. Moving right along, and yes, we're not done yet. I really wanted to get a lot of studying in for this first episode. Um, this time, I'm going to do a study of a watercolor painting by Joseph Zbukvig. I'm still terrible at saying his name, but there's one major thing I would like to focus on practicing with this specific study, and that is the calligraphic quality of lines when quickly doing ripples and water reflections. Unlike the last two studies, this one is a bit more of a traditional environment. It has a sky and a horizon line, which means I'm going to go back to my normal approach of painting from back to front, starting with a basic sky tone and then filling in the distance mountains first. I've also gone back to using my normal dry brush for most of this study. I really enjoy watercolor artists because they can do so much with just a few strokes. The minimalism and impressionism is lovely and I'm doing my best to provide it some justice with this brush. I'm making a lot of chaos in the midground, just hoping that I can do it in a way that makes the viewer fill in their own details. A few details, such as ship masts and a couple figures, can really go a long way to help provide context to what is mostly just chaos. One of my favorite parts of the original painting is the deep rusty red colors that sneak their way into various parts of the painting, often showing up in the darkest shadows where the main ship and the dock meet the water. The reflections and shadows on the water also have a nice turquoise hue to them. I noticed it's important to just blur the line between the object and its reflection when trying to emulate watercolor art. The base color for the water also has a subtle gradient to it, getting a little darker toward the bottom of the canvas. This could either be the neutralized reflection by looking down toward the water at a steeper angle, or perhaps it's the mirrored gradient of the sky which naturally gets darker as you go further from the horizon. Before getting into any of the water ripples, I'm just putting in every shadow and reflection as a simplified mass and gradient. This somewhat creates the illusion that the water is frozen and you're just looking at ships stuck in ice. The ships themselves are pretty simple. The bright accent colors do go a long way in creating appeal in the piece though. Everything might have actually looked quite dull if we didn't have that stripe of red or blue on each ship hull. With most of that finished, it's finally time to start adding our calligraphy to these waves and ripples. I'll be honest, my lines are somewhat terrible when compared to a real watercolor artist, but I'll do my best. Good Z lines can go a long way in making nice ripples. In hindsight, I think it would have been better to try and get a brush that had a huge weight variation in it so you can really get some thick lines and sharp tapers. I used mostly the thick and thin pen and scratchboard tool for the lines, which is just my normal drawing brush. 
Anyway, there's a lot of going back and forth with the light and dark values, trying to get the ripples to look all right. Definitely not the best method for doing it, but I'll keep trying to improve. Obviously, ideally, you'd be doing them in single, lovely, beautiful strokes. And here we have the finished study. The time spent on this one was roughly just 45 minutes, so it was a bit of a faster one. But once again, much admiration to Joseph's Buchweg for the original. Trying to copy someone's art can certainly make you appreciate it that much more. I just love it. Okay, so now that we've done one photo study and two artist studies, for the sake of practice, I'm actually going to do one more photo study. And to make it more amusing to myself, I'm going to use a photo I took myself on my phone. This was taken at night near Christmas time in a community near my house that's built on a man-made lake. It's not a great composition or well-taken picture, but it does have a ton of colorful water reflections in it. So I think it'll be fun. Before I get to the crazy water stuff, I'm going to try and paint everything else first. I was a bit too lazy to bother with any line work this time, so the finished result might wind up a little different than the original. Night paintings are definitely tricky. Everything is basically black with subtle variations of value and color. Anytime the overall contrast range is shrunk down, the accuracy at which you need to pick your colors becomes far more challenging. This image also has the added challenge of being filled with tiny little lights everywhere. You might notice that I'm doing my best to pick the colors as they appear versus what my brain's telling me they should be. I know in my brain, for example, that the boats are actually white, but I'm using deep purples and blues to show that in the painting. It's extremely important that you can forget the iconography and separate reality from perception. It's one of the keys to getting good at painting. I was also worried about picking the right colors for the houses, but this super dark beige seems to be working all right. Picking a good value to represent the lights proved to be a bit more difficult though. I didn't feel happy with anything I was choosing so far. Luckily, I have the glow brush to just crank up the volume on all of the light sources and make them really shine. I'm still not sure if this is the best way to do things, but I'm going to once again go through and add the reflections as if there were no ripples in the water and then just chop things up after. There is one important observation I'm going to make, and that is to bring in lots of saturation on the reflections. Despite the light sources themselves being very close to white, it seems to be best if the reflections are just bleeding through with the strongest saturations from those lit areas. This study is again being done with the dry brush, so that lets me have a nice smooth blending of these bright colors. It's very important that things look good during this glassy stage, otherwise they're definitely not going to look good once I start adding more chaos. That's really a key to all types of painting though. If things don't look good at a simplified level, then they won't look good no matter how much you render them. To finish off this painting, I'm just going to go overboard with the choppiness and ripples. I'm switching to the sharper drawing tools again, and I'm just putting in as many details as I can. The main problem that I'm running into is that the edges are all feeling a little too sharp. It's a bit unnatural. Things are definitely not meshing well with the rest of the painting, but I'll just have to learn from these mistakes and go forward into the future with those new observations. It's actually quite possible that I created too much chaos in the water. It's certainly lacking the simplified artistic appeal of a nice watercolor painting. In the end, I guess I managed to do a decent job with the realism side of things, but the appeal level was definitely lacking. It can be hard to tackle both when you're studying. I hope you enjoyed seeing this one though, and in fact I hope you enjoyed watching all of these because finally we've reached the end of this study session. Hopefully you managed to absorb some good tips or tricks from watching someone else study. Maybe this would be a nice video series to bring in guest artists. We'll see. There are plenty of topics out there that need to be covered, but if you have any strong recommendations for an episode of this series, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I would like to thank everyone for watching and also give a big thank you to all of my patron supporters as always. Every bit helps and they're helping a lot.
And if you're interested in Corel Painter, be sure to check out a trial in the description below or save $100 off a digital version using my little code, which is also in the description below. All right, see you guys.